Hello everyone, welcome. My name is Rodrigo and I will be hosting today's webinar on drawing the Mendel Rosette. If you are watching this live on dialogue.tv, be sure to log into the chat so that you can actually live so that you can actually ask live questions. I have someone to help me out and Adam will be relaying the questions to me so that I can answer them live. And if for some reason you do not want to participate in the chat or if you if your answer does not get I'm sorry, if your question does not get answered during my live presentation, then I will be answering further questions at the end. So today we will be talking about the Mendel Rosette and the Mendel Rosette and today's presentation is going to be something that I really appreciate because I really like mathematics and one of the reasons I got into programming was to explore mathematics with computers. And that's why I'm doing today's webinar on this subject. And so that you know where we are headed, the end goal for today is to draw the Mendel set and save it to a file so that we actually have an image of the set. Now, what is the Mendel set? Oh, this is amazing. I'm showing a rookie mistake. Why am I showing the wrong? I'm so sorry, everyone. This is what I wanted to show. Oh gosh, it's, I think you can tell I'm a beginner at this, so you'll have to you'll have to excuse me for this. I was pretty sure I had I had that correctly set up, and that just means that everything else will be in the wrong screen. But let's pretend that that didn't happen, and let's proceed. So the image you have right in front of you is a representation of the complex plane. And what is the complex plane? So the complex plane is just this um, mathematical construct where you have numbers that are represented by two parts. And there's the real part that goes from the left to the right, and it's represented in here on this axis, and there's the imaginary part that's represented with this vertical axis. And Dialog does offer support for complex numbers uh, right off the bat. So I can go ahead and open my interpreter, and if I type in, say, 4j2, then this is a complex number whose real part is 4 and whose imaginary part is 2. That is, it would be this number right here. And if I, if I want to type in this number, for example, this would be 2j minus 3. So this is this complex number. So we need these complex numbers to define the Mendel set. Now, you'll have to excuse me for a second because I did have everything in the wrong screen, so I do need to move a couple of things to their correct places, otherwise I'll be uh, stopping plenty of times during the presentation. So those were my notes in case I forget something, which is bound to happen with this uh, great start. Uh, okay, <laughs> so this is the complex plane, like I said, and we do need this plane and we do need these numbers to represent the Mendel set. Why? Because the Mendel set is just a mathematical construct, okay? It's a mathematical object that is defined with some formula, which we will look into uh, right in a second, and it's, it just so happens that it's defined over the complex numbers. And also, I think I should have started with this disclaimer. So if you are familiar with the Mendel set, do not expect me to do uh, very advanced things today. So yeah, I'm sorry to disappoint you if you are very knowledgeable in this field. Now, I think the really important thing to do next is to define the set. So if this is a set, or in other words, not being so precise, if this is a bag of numbers, if this is a mathematical construct that contains some complex numbers, how do I determine if a complex number is in there? So what do I do? Or how do I do it? And I think the, the easiest way to show you how it works is by 
or the easiest way to define it is by actually showing you an example and then letting you um, generalize in your own heads. So let me let me take a complex number C. So C is a complex number. And now in order to determine if C is in the mendel set or not, what I need is an auxiliary function. And let me define it as being alpha plus omega squared. So now I have this auxiliary function and I have a complex number C and I can determine or I can try to determine if C is in the set or not. And so what I'm going to do is take a look at the magnitude of C. This is the magnitude of C. Next, I'll take a look at the magnitude of CFC. And then I'll, took a, I'll take a look at the magnitude of CFCFC. And then I'll add another CF there, and then another one, and etc. and etc. And as you can see, there's no pun intended. As you can see, the, the magnitude is a number that sometimes grows and sometimes decreases from 1.26 to 0 0.99, etc. And in order to actually define if C is in the set or not, we say the following. If this number right here, so if the magnitude of these uh, successive applications of C, F, C, F, C, F, etc., if this number grows a lot, grows unbounded, or as I will be saying, explodes, if this number explodes, if the magnitude explodes, then C does not belong to the mendel set. For example, if I condense this a little bit, and if I just apply the function f, let's say, 20 times, we can see here, maybe it's not obvious because this is fairly hidden, but this number ends with e24, which means that this is 3.25 times 10 to the power of 24, which means this number is already fairly large. I don't want to edit this. No, thank you. So this number is already fairly large. And that means that C, this C, which was 0.4j.6, this does not belong to the Mendelbrot set. Now, can we take a look at a point that belongs to the Mendelbrot set? Well, of course, let's just define C to be zero. Magnitude of C is zero, and then you square it and add zero to that and it remains zero and then you go again and again and again and many times and it stays zero so the number zero obviously and that's not how you spell obviously obviously belongs to the mendel set so i hope this is making sense so far i'll give you like 15 seconds to ask any questions you might have while i take a sip of water So this is the very basic or the, the very basic building block you need in order to start working with a Mandelbrot set. So how do we do neat things with it now? Well, the first thing we are going to do is writing a short one-liner, so a short line of code to create our first pictorial representation of the Mandelbrot set. And if you are experienced APLers, then I think you are used to APL's expressiveness and to the fact that you can actually do a lot of things with just a single line of code. But to me, as I'm fairly new to the APL world, this is still this still impresses me a lot. So I still find what I'm about to write really impressive. So if you'll excuse me, let me show you the complex plane again. What we will be doing is we will be taking a look at the plane and we will be creating a grid just like the one we have here. And where these lines cross, we will be creating points. So we are going to sample the plane and we are going to apply that, uh, that um, F function repeatedly on the whole grid. And essentially, we are just trying to determine if many different numbers are in the set or not at once with a whole array because APL 
should be maybe the array programming language. So let's work with arrays, of course. And I'm just stressing this out because I come from, I think we can say I come from a Python background and this wouldn't be obvious. I would be writing plenty of for loops to do what I'm about to do. And in our quest to sample the plane, let's start by creating an axis. And that's going to be just a vector with numbers from zero to one. And in order to do that, I'll assign the axis to A and N is going to be a measure of the, the, let's say, fineness. It's going to define how many points I have or how many ticks I have in that axis. And so what I just need to do is do this. And of course, I need to assign to N some initial value. And let's start with something small because as I as I make mistakes, I'll want to be able to spot the mistakes quickly. So this is our axis. And now I want to create a grid. So I need to take the two axes and create an horizontal one and a vertical one. And the horizontal one is going to be the real axis and the vertical one is going to be the imaginary axis. And in order to create this, uh, this plane, let's just use the outer product with an addition. So I'm essentially looking to do something like this but if i just if i just do this then what i get is real numbers all over the place so i need to make sure that on the right i have imaginary numbers now this is really hard to read so let me decrease the print precision so that we can more easily take a look at this and maybe if i choose a nicer number here it's slightly easier to read. So you can see here the first column, the real numbers 0 to 1, and then one column to the right, there's still 0 to 1, but now the imaginary part is 0 0.1, and if I go to the right then the imaginary part increases, and etc. Now what I need to do is reorient this so that the real part is increasing from the left to the right, and the imaginary part is increasing from the bottom to the top. And so we start by transposing so that from left to right the real part increases. And again, the real part is the numbers that are to the left of the J. And the only thing that is left is fixing the imaginary parts because right now they are decreasing if you go from the top to the bottom. And I want to flip this. So all I need to do is reverse first. So now I have a grid. And if you'll excuse me, this grid is from this section of the plane. So it's the top right corner. But what we know, and we know from pictures, from the Wikipedia page, from experiments, we know that the Mendel set is somewhere around here. So it would be helpful if I could take the grid that I just defined in here, and if I could recenter it so that it encompasses the whole part of the plane where I know the set is. And it's fairly easy to see that numbers that are way out here, so numbers that are far away from the origin, those will never be in the Mandelbrot set. So I can really just take a look at a neighborhood of zero. So how do I do this? Well, the first thing I'm going to do is to make sure that I have um, negative and positive imaginary parts. So let me, yes, I would very much want to do that, but actually I think it's smarter if we start with something else, which is rescaling the square. So right now we have this one by one square and let's make it larger because if I want to encompass the whole, the whole set, I need something larger. So let's go ahead and scale it by a factor of three. And I could pretend I'm just guessing, but I've tested this, so 3 is more than enough. So you can see here, everything is 3 times larger than before. Now what we can do is center the imaginary parts so that they go from minus 1.5 to 1.5. And in order to do that, we just need to sum, to add a shift in the form of a complex number. And you can see here that now the middle row has no imaginary parts, which is the same as having imaginary part equal to zero. And now there's negative and positive imaginary parts. 
and now we do also a shift on the real part. Now I could shift this so that it's centered around zero. I could do this and now we can see that the center of the grid is the origin. But the Mandelbrot set is a little bit to the left. So I can shift this a bit further. So let's just do that because why not? So you can see here it starts at minus 2.1 and it goes up to 0 0.9. Now the next step is let's take our grid and apply F a bunch of times. And a bunch is not a very mathematical term, but let's let's do that. Let's apply F a bunch of times here. Now there's only the question of well exactly how do I apply it or what I might what am I going to write? And you did see me writing something like this. And just, just in case you're not used to it, this is the same as, well, doing this. So I'm using the selfie operator to make sure that the C also works as a left argument. And so I could essentially write this. And that's this is the syntax I'm going to use with my whole grid. So let me apply f a bunch of times, like I said, and here a bunch of times is defined to be 9, and we will see why it's 9 in a second. And, well, I, we can do this, so let's see what happens. So we can see here that now we have some complex numbers. These are not really that easy to parse, but don't worry about it, because I'm not interested in those numbers, I'm interested in their magnitudes, and in particular I'm interested in checking whether these magnitudes are large or not. And with a little bit of maths, you can show that it's enough to check if the magnitude is smaller than 2 or not. So right now we have a Boolean mask that represents the points in this grid that are still small, and by still small I mean they have a magnitude smaller than 2, after applying f 9 times. And now that I have this, and by the way, notice that I have quad IO set to zero, and this will be really important because we are about to do some indexing. So I have quad IO set to zero, just in case you are typing this along or you are watching this video later. This is a mask of zeros and ones, and I can use this to index into this string, this string with two characters. And there you go. It's our very first pictorial, pictorial representation of the Mendel Ross set. And you might argue it's not very interesting, and well, I agree with you. But what we can do is increase this parameter right here. And now you can see it, but if I decrease the font size, you can see this is starting to look better. Except it's the proportion is a little bit off. So what we can do is I'm adding a to replicate, so every character was duplicated horizontally. And I don't know if you are impressed, but I am impressed. And this is our very first pictor pictorial representation of the Mandelbrot set. Now let's keep going. Let's increase the font size again so that I can read what I'm typing. By the way, this is what I added, the to replicate. Now the next step is in making this representation a little bit more interesting. In here I only have two characters because what I produced was a boolean mask that represents which points already left the set, which are the blanks, and the points that haven't left the set yet. And what I mean here with haven't left the set yet is really something that I would say it's important because it's it's how the maths works and so the definition of the Mandelbrot set really is you do that C F C F C F C sequence for all numbers of F's so you do this with one F with two F's with three F's with four F's etc and you take a look at the limit so what would happen after an infinite amount of applications but this is a computer, so we can't really do this an infinite amount of times and then see what happens. We need to approximate this. And that's why 
we only applied f nine times. We are doing an approximation. If after nine applications of f, the number already exploded, then fine. We give it a blank space. It, it definitely is not in the Mandelbrot set. But if after nine times it hasn't exploded yet, then we will just pretend that the number belongs to the Mandelbrot set because we can't really know for sure if it does belong or not. Now, the thing that people usually do when they want to create a nice representation of the set is they apply this function many different times and instead of just looking at whether the magnitude of the result was large or not, what they do is they count the number of iterations that it takes for a point to go above the threshold that we are using. And the threshold we are using right now is 2. So we take a look at how long it takes to explode and then we color the point accordingly. So let's not color it right right now. Let's take a set of interesting Unicode characters that I have right here in my right screen. So give me a second to copy them. To cap to copy them. Okay, so these are the characters we are going to be using. And see here that these characters are in a way adding some shading. So we, we will use them to shade our set. So let's go ahead and recover our one-liner. So we will be taking these numbers here, sorry, these characters here, and we will be indexing into them. But this, this only produces a binary mask, and we want to produce the indices from 0 to 4. So how do we do that? Let's do it in a rudimentary way first. So we take the grid. This is the grid. We take it and we replicate it some amount of times. And now instead of applying f with a power, we apply f with a scan so that we get intermediate results. And like I said, this is not optimal in any way whatsoever. We apply f and we collect the intermediate results with the with the scan. And maybe I should show it to you. So let's do a small number in here. So this is the initial grid, this on the left. This is after one application of f. This is after two applications of f, etc. And now what we do is, for all the intermediate values, we check if they are small or not. And then we sum across the different iterations. And now what this tells me is, how many iterations did this point take to blow up? Well, it was already so large that it didn't even take a single iteration. It was already too large. And these three points, for example, these never left the Mendelbrot set. These never exploded. So we take this that builds an integer matrix like this, and then we disclose it, and now we just normalize it so that we actually get integers, uh, integer indices from 0 to 4. So what we need to do is we need to divide by the maximum number that can show up here, which is the number of iterations, and then we multiply by 4, and in the end we round up for good measure, and then we take indices we take the characters and use them to index into the string. There you have it. Now let me make this larger again. And let me zoom out. Again, the proportion is a little bit weird. So let me add a two replicates. And there you go. Something slightly more interesting, I would say. Now the next step is in making this image more fine-grained. So there's there's little detail in here. This is too wobbly. And fractals and the Mandelbrot set are usually known for their intricate details. And the reason we do not have much detail here is because our approximation is fairly bad. We only apply our function f nine times, and then we look at the magnitude of the values. So what we would want to do is 
let me decrease this again what we would want to do is write a larger number in here for example 50 but we cannot do that right now and why not because of this domain error right here our grid is fairly large and in doing this 50 times in applying f 50 times we are trying to square really large numbers and these are numbers that are so large that when we try to square them we get a domain error because the power function does not the power primitive does not know how to square numbers so large that cannot fit into memory so how do we deal with this well i'm starting to really stretch uh, what this one liner can do but let's play with it just a little bit more so i'm going to take this function and write a sort of filter so that only numbers that are not large yet get multiplied so let's do that let's take this m and make it a mask that represents the numbers that are still small and now let's do the following i only want to square the numbers that are still small so notice that large numbers become zero so now i can square them and then well i just add alpha because that's the formula but now I need to compensate for the large numbers that I, in a way, erased from here. So what I do is I multiply with the mask again so that only the small numbers get their formulas applied. And then in here, I just, in a way, let's reset the large numbers. So what the right hand side does is it applies the formula to small numbers and it leaves large numbers untouched. And so if I redefine f, I can run this 50 times now. And again, not very interesting, so let's make it larger. Let's fix the proportion already, maybe even larger. Can I do this? Now let's give it a second, and now let's zoom out. If you are not impressed, then I don't want to continue. Let's take a look at this. Isn't this amazing with one line of code? Okay, now let's do something less um, wasteful. Let's write a bit of code that is slightly more optimized and slightly better to do this. So let me zoom in. By the way, you could clap. I know I can't hear you nor see you, but you can clap if you are impressed. If, if you are at home or at work, clap slowly. Okay, now what are we doing? Let's write a couple of functions to help us on our journey. So someone is asking, why not cap it by using the floor? Oh, I get what you're, what you're asking. Well, because first time around I came up with that and it was just working, so I didn't explore it any further because now we are going to do something that really is smarter and I didn't take too much time to figure out what's the best way to, to fiddle with F. Um, and thank you for the claps. I've, I have been told that someone clapped in the chat, so thank you very much. Now, <laughs> <coughs> sorry, I need a little bit of water. Okay, now it may seem like we haven't done much, but actually we have done a lot. And now it's just a, a, a matter of cleaning up a little bit. So first things first, let's take a look at the one liner to see what we actually need to do. So we are going to take this bit over here that's creating a grid and we will write it as a proper function that creates grids that fit our needs and in particular this is a square grid so we will write not so but because of that this hinders a little bit our flexibility and the function we will be writing right now will allow us to create rectangular grids and we have this bit right here this f scan thing that is computing the partial results but in a very wasteful way because the scan of f is quadratic, so I'm really recomputing way too many things. And also, this f 
this has been tainted by this little thingy so that I didn't get domain error. So let's also deal with that. Let's start with read. Let me let me just link my the things I'm doing to a directory so that I can um, save the contents of what I'm doing for later. So let's edit this grid different. And what this grid function does is it's going to take omega and omega is going to be the omega is the amount of points or complex numbers, yeah, points in the plane, of points per unit length. And alpha is going to give me the center, the width, and the height of the grid. So these are the parameters of our function. Now what we need to do, we need to create the real axis, the imaginary axis. We need to do an outer product to make sure we have a matrix that represents the plane. And we need to make sure that the center is correct. So doing this is really simple. The real axis is going to be what? It's, it's fairly similar. Let's erase most of this. It's fairly similar to what is going on in here. So I need to create the numbers that I need. I need to normalize them and then make sure they have the correct length, which happens later. So how many numbers do we need? We need as many numbers as the number of points per unit length times the width. Now this should really be a ceiling, just in case this is not a whole number, and my bad, that should be a W. Now we need to normalize this, and we divide by the number of points that the unit length has, so that now this is a vector of numbers from 0 to W, and, and that's that. <laughs> this is the real axis. Now the imaginary one is similar, except with a, an H instead of a W, and then, and then we want these to be imaginary numbers. And also, let's flip this already so that the outer product produces things in the order that I really want, so that we don't have to reverse things and rotate them later or transpose them. Now what we need to do is create the plane, and it's the imaginary axis on the left and the real axis on the right, so that the real and imaginary parts change like in the complex plane in the picture I showed you. And now what we have left is recentering this. And the way we recenter something is by figuring out the translation vector. So the vector that points from the old center to the new center, and that's going to be the old center my bad, it's going to be the new center minus the old center. And I tend to write like this. Now the new center is just center. And obviously I should have started with unpacking things so that I have access to the things I need. And that's not an A, that's an alpha. So the new center is the center that's given by alpha and the old center is the center that's baked into these calculations, and that's going to be W divided by 2 and H divided by 2. So it's going to be W divided by 2, this is the real part, plus the imaginary part, or the imaginary part of the center, which is H. Sorry, this is Python speaking louder than APL. I really apologize for that. And this is the imaginary part. And now I tend to prefer this written in a different way, so now we can leave it like that. So let me fix that, and let's test it. Let's take maybe the grid here, with 10 points. 10 points may be too much to compare by with our eyes, so a grid with 4 points. What's the center here? Notice that the center is minus 0 0.6. So now let's say that I have a grid that's centered around 0 0.6. The width and the height are 3. 
and the points per unit length those are going to be okay so now this is if i make this say six sorry i'm just using the parameters that allow me to do things with some ease now two points per unit length and you can see here that these match so our grid function does seem to be working so now we can create large grids and we can change the proportions so now we have more columns than rows so this is the grid function and the function that we need afterwards is the function that takes a grid and computes the intermediate values so how do we do that let's write a thread that does that for us now on the left we are going to be taking the maximum number of iterations and on the right we take the grid and let's return the iteration counts so the iterations and in here let's i don't want to spoil the fun i was going to localize some names that i already know i'll need but let's do that later so what do we need we are going to need a mask that keeps track of the numbers that i'm still worried about okay and this is going to be a mask that starts off as ones for each of the numbers in the grid and i'm i'm reveling here because it's it's going to be easier to use a compress with naturally vectors i can't use a compress with the matrices so that's why i'm reveling but actually i don't want to touch this i want to leave this as is so what i need is a vector of c's that is going to hold the complex numbers and that's why c's c for complex and s because it's more than one the complex numbers that i have so far so this is going to be changed in every iteration it's going to hold the intermediate values and i also need the original c's because i need them on the left of f so i can just start off with all of these so my original C's, my C's and my M are localized. And so I can actually say that I have one, one, one for each C. And likewise, the iteration counts start off as zeros. And I have a zero for each C. Now, the next thing I need is the function, naturally. So I need the function that computes the subsequent values and now I can just iterate over everything and notice that I'm using the underscore here as a sync because I don't really care about the iteration I met I only care about the fact that I want to do this repeatedly now what do we do we just update everything so again m is a mask of the numbers that I'm still worried about so m compress something can be read as and here is something this can be read as the numbers that i care about so m compress c's let's update those to be the original c's and then f of the c's but again i don't want to waste any time doing things that i don't need so let's do this over compression by m the next thing I do is I update the iteration counts. So for the numbers that I still care about, I increase the iteration counts. And finally, I update my M mask. And how do I update it in here? Well, I need to take a look at the values that I just computed and see which ones still have a magnitude smaller than 2. So I hope this makes some sense. The M compress here is the thing that is being used to make sure we don't waste too much time with things that we don't really need. And this is not the most optimized code ever, but it's much smarter than the scan we were doing before. And before we return, we just uh, reshape the iteration counts so that it matches the shape of the grid. So if we feed a matrix to the Mandelbrot function, then we get a matrix back exactly the same shape. So let me fix this. And now let's, I have a grid over here, so let's assign that to G. And now let me 
compute the number of iterations with our new function. And if you look here, there's these pens right here that show numbers that didn't leave the set and numbers here that left the set quickly. Oh, and by the way, we can do this with many more iterations than just those 10 or 9. So this appears to be working, right? Final step, assign these numbers to colors. Generally speaking, what is done is people create a gradient of colors and depending on the number that shows up in here, they pick a color and then they just create a, an image from that. So let me close this, we don't need it for now. Let's create a, a simple function to generate a gray palette of colors. That's not what I wanted, okay. So let's create a gray scale of colors and let's say that omega is the number of colors we need. And this is, this is a pattern we've been using today repeatedly. We just generate as many numbers as we need. We normalize them. And now we multiply by the maximum value that we want. That's 255 because these are going to represent RGB colors. So these are the grays. If only I knew how to type. So these are the grays. Now what do we, know? What do, we do now? We want the palettes to be a 3 by omega matrix or 3 by omega plus 1. So let's produce a 3 by omega plus 1 matrix where each row represents one of red, green and blue channels so that later, and by later I mean just in a second, we can use some simple indexing to produce the final image that we need. So we have the grays right here, and now we need to make sure we have a 3 by this matrix. Now let me think for a second. Yeah, we can just take the grays and reshape them into what we need. So let's reshape them into 3 and their shape. So this is the reshape we care about. And the final thing is black is at the beginning. Let's move it to the end for a nice effect when we color the set. Now let's fix this and call it. So this is a shade of gray. The second column has a second shade of gray, etc. And the final column has black. Uh, yes. So someone is asking something about the Mandelbrot function, so let's take a look at that real quickly. So OCS, so the original Cs, and the Cs all get initialized to be the revel of the grid. Okay. Now this is the gray palettes. And the final step is producing the PNG. So if you are using Windows, you could use quad new bitmap. But let's be friendly to the people running other um, operating systems and let's do something that's cross-platform. And so I'll be using um, a tool that you can find online and I will link to it in the end. Let me link to it with a hyperlink. Now let me link to it with the link source management software and where is it it's in here what did i do do i already have it in here oh maybe i already had it yes i definitely have it already so this png namespace you can find it online by nicolas Del uh, delcros i think has this write function that we can actually take a 
quick look at it. So this is the whole namespace and the right function is expecting a pixel matrix here on the right and a file name on the left and it will create a PNG out of the pixel matrix. Now the format of the pixel matrix is fairly simple. We want it to be one integer per pixel and the integers should be the 256 encode of the R, G and V channels. And this is easy to achieve for us because we have the palette in this format. So I have, do I have a grid? I have a grid here. And do I have an, I have this number of iterations. So let's compute, recompute these with a smaller number of maximum iterations. So the Mendel row here with the grid. Now I create a palette with the corresponding number of colors. And now what I do is, uh, let's do it one step at a time. If I take the palettes and index with the its, then the first matrix gives me the red channel, the green channel, and the blue channel. But now I can easily encode this with 256. Let me define it to be the colors of the pixels, or maybe the pixmat to match Nicholas's function. And now what I can do is, let's go on and save this as uh, our very small PNG, so PNG dot write pixmat. And it already returned, so let me open this. It's already in here, and it's really, really small. It's in there, but it's really, really small. But now we know the code works, so now we can make something larger. And how do we do that? So this is a very small grid. Let's instead make it centered around the same point. Let's let's make it with the same dimensions, but now instead of just 10 points or whatever that was, let's make it have 300 points per unit length. So that's going to be 900 by 600. And instead of just 10 iterations, let's use 50. Then we create 50 shades of gray. Then we assign the colors to the pixmat and then we write it. Let me see, did I close the file? Yes, I did. So now I can run this and then I can show you the image. And this was fairly low effort. The image could look better with colors instead of a grayscale thingy, but this was fairly effortless, okay, if we ignore the problems I had with the screens being all wrong when I started. Okay, so what's next? What can we do next? I have I don't have much time left because people have lives. So let me show you a slightly nicer palette of colors. And I would love to write it from scratch for you, but it's it's not very to be honest, it's not that interesting. It's much because it's a dumbed down version of something that could look really, 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 really great. And instead, this will just look great. So you will also get a link to this. And what this is doing is it's taking some predefined colors. So let me get this to be larger. OK, so we are taking some predefined colors. And we are pairwise interpolating them linearly, which is not very interesting. That's why this is a dumbed down version of what you can find here. But we interpolate linearly between these two colors, between these two colors, between these two colors, etc. And then we return the whole palette together. And this seg function is interpolating. So maybe I should have called this image. It was seg for segments, but this is actually interpolating. So now we have another palette. And so we can just recreate the palette here. So instead of using this gray palette, we use this one. We do the same indexing. Now let me close the file. It's already closed. And then we can rewrite the PNG. And we have something that looks a bit neater, except for some reason this is kind of yellowish. So I, I'm probably off by one. Oh, actually, I know what I am off by. It's the maximum number of iterations, it's useful if it's a multiple of four because of my 
basic palette function. So 40 iterations, 40 colors in my palettes. And now we can open it again and it's no longer yellowish. So this is it. Now, how do we reduce these bands over here? You can increase the maximum number of iterations because the number of iterations gives you or refines the number of colors in your gradient. And so if it is more refined, it will be harder to notice the, the bands. So let's do 400 iterations on each one and then 400 colors. And then this is the same. Now it takes a little bit more time because it's computing more things. And then again, now it's so refined that the colors here are weird. So the thing you would do to make this interesting again is you would zoom in on the picture. And so let's run this at a specific point that I know is interesting while I mention a couple of things. So this is just a matter of experimenting. Basically, this is me pasting a center that I know looks interesting. And while this runs, let me tell you about the links that I'll be sharing later. So, oops. So this was a fairly basic webinar. And by the way, if you couldn't tell, we are near the end. This was a fairly basic webinar on drawing the metal rose set. I will be linking to a dialogue blog post that Brian wrote on making this faster with isolates. I think that's how you say it. Isolates, isolates. Yeah, so that's an interesting read. And I will also link to Nicholas's paper on the Vector Journal, which is where I got this PNG namespace from. And it's also where he writes about another way to visualize the Mandelbrot set. You will also get a link to the code that I wrote, or at least a very similar version, because I I have, a rev, I have a reference version, just in case I screw everything up, but this was written from scratch now, so it might have small differences. And things that you can Google for to make this nicer is proper palettes with some nice interpolation to create some really good uh, gradients or ways to properly zoom in on the Mandelbrot on the Mandelbrot set, because our our zoom that I did here by specifying some center, but then a small width and a very large um, number of pixels, this is a very basic zoom and floating point inaccuracies start to kick in at this point and it's hard to create a nice image. So this already concluded, now I can show it to you. So it's not as nice as the images you can find online, but it's it's pretty decent, I think, for the amount of code that we wrote, which is very, very little. So to recap, I have this very small slide deck, but of course it's on the wrong it's on the wrong screen, so let me make sure that I show it on the correct screen, and that would be by going here. And first I should stop the presentation I already started on the wrong screen change it to this screen, I think. Yes. Okay, so a very quick recap of the code we wrote. This is the one-liner with uh, interesting Unicode characters. This is a slightly condensed, so I, I, I moved three of the lines to this line. This is the grid function that creates a grid that can be rectangular. Then we have our Mandelbrot function, which is fairly simple, to be honest. We didn't do anything too fancy. We just compressed the numbers we are working with. So this is our Mandelbrot function. And then we have our palette, our more slightly more interesting palette and the grayscale palette in here. And the way you use it is really simple. We create a grid and we feed it to the Mandelbrot function we create the palette accordingly, and of course this should probably be a parameter, so this shouldn't be hard-coded, it should be some variable that then I tweak to my liking. Then we index into the palette and encode the colors, and we write Nicholas's, sorry, we use Nicholas's uh, code to write it as a PNG. 
and the, the point being this should work cross-platform as opposed to what I was going to use which only works on Windows so this is basically what we've done today and next steps like I said would be working on the palette experimenting with the palette making it nicer maybe use a different color space so instead of RGB use the HSV color space that would be easier to produce nice gradients implement some nice zooming capabilities so that we can zoom in and still produce really uh, really detailed images maybe look at Julia sets which are another type of fractal that is very closely related to the Mandelbrot set and just overall explore this theme because it's really really interesting now these are some of the useful links that you might need there's a Jupyter notebook with a more detailed exploration of the one-liner there's Brian Becker's post on the Mandelbrot set plus isolates there's Nicholas's um, article and that's where I got the PNG namespace from and then there's today's code also available online as for future webinars or web, uh, upcoming webinars there's the every other week there's a BAA webinar the next two will be open sessions and then there's the annual general meeting and every four weeks there's a dialogue webinar so today I just did one in four weeks there's part three of error handling with Adam and then four weeks from that still to be determined what will be who will be talking about and what that didn't sound like proper English yeah if if you couldn't tell I'm not a native English speaker so I, I do apologize for any butchering I might have done of words in general and these BAA sessions they are I think anyone can attend you just have to sign up to get the link and the password and you can go to the British APL Association.org website for that so if you're still sitting there after all of this thank you very much thank you for your attention and I will be answering any leftover questions that you might have to the best of my ability and by the way just I just got breaking news that the webinar that is TBD might be so this one here might be about databases so like I said thank you very much and have a nice day and see you next time hopefully also turns out you don't really need to sign up for the BAA webinars I did think with we needed that but you can just go there and I think there's a link with a password so you can just attend okay I'll just give you maybe a couple of more seconds to type in any questions and otherwise I will close this or at least turn off my face so that you can clear this image out of your heads I, I know there's an awkward silence right now but I did feel like there was something coming in but I, I don't think so so Thank you once more and I'll see you next time.